Good afternoon. My name is Avi Noam Pat. I'm the director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. I want to thank you all for joining us here today for our program, a conversation with Grzegorz Kwiatkowski, uh, featuring our uh, very own professor, uh, Peter Constantine. Uh, we are pleased at the Center for Judaic Studies to co-sponsor this program today, along with uh, the Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, and our program in Translation Studies. Uh, for all who are uh, observing today, I'd also like to wish you a happy Purim. Today is the uh, Jewish holiday of Purim, so it's uh, nice for all of us to gather uh, today on a festive day for uh, what I'm sure will be a fascinating uh, program and conversation. Uh, just a couple of technical notes before I introduce our speakers and our uh, our program today. You'll note that uh, you've all been uh, muted as you've joined the program. This is to minimize uh, disruptions uh, while we're uh, recording the program. Although I would very much encourage you to use the chat feature um, to uh, type in questions that you might have uh, for both of our speakers, for uh, Grzegorz Kwiatkowski or for Professor Constantine, and we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of our uh, discussion today. So it's a real pleasure uh, for me to uh, welcome our uh, two speakers. Uh, Grzegorz Kwiatkowski is a Polish poet and musician and author of several books of poetry which revolve around the subjects of history, remembrance, and ethics. He is also a member of the psychedelic rock band Trupa Trupa. He has been a beneficiary of numerous international literary programs such as being an artist in residence in Vienna and uh, the Styria artist in residence in Graz. He co-hosted the workshop Virus of Hate at the University of Oxford, and has also been a guest lecturer at uh, UC Berkeley, at Stanford University, at Johns Hopkins University, at the University of Chicago, at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, at many, many uh, different, uh, different distinguished institutions. Together with UCLA professor Vinay Lal, he began the series Sangam and Akora, a forum of poets, philosophers, scholars, and autodidacts. He's a member of PEN America and the European literature platform of Versopolis, and was a guest of a number of festivals such as Oslo International Poesia Festival and Lati International Writers Reunion. His music and literary works have been published and reviewed in The Guardian, The New York Times, The Times of Israel, Genocide Studies and Prevention, Modern Poetry and Translation, and many, many other uh, distinguished publications. As a musician, he performed with his band at such events as Desert Day Festival, Rockaway Beach Festival, South by Southwest, Primavera Sound, and Iceland uh, Airwaves. And you can also see a performance by their band as part of the legendary uh, NPR Tiny Desk Sessions or B BBC Radio 6 uh, Music Sessions. So it's really an, an honor to welcome uh, the poet Grzegorz Kwiatkowski. In conversation with Grzegorz will be uh, Professor Peter Constantine, who is a literary translator and editor and the director of the literary translation program at the University of Connecticut. Among his translations published by Random House include The Essential Writings of Rousseau, The Essential Writings of Machiavelli, and works by Tolstoy, Gogol, and Voltaire. His translation of the complete works of Isaac Babel received the Coret Jewish Liter Literature Award and a National Jewish Book Award citation. He co-edited A Century of Greek Poetry, 1900 to 2000, and the anthology The Greek Poets, Homer to the Present, published by W.W. W. Norton in 2010. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow and was awarded the Penn Translation Prize for six early stories by Thomas Mann and the National Translation Award for the Undiscovered Chekhov. Peter Constantine has been a fellow at the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library and a Berlin Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. Peter is also the founder and publisher of World Poetry Books, which is committed to publishing exceptional translations of poetry from a broad range of languages and traditions, bringing the work of modern masters, emerging voices, and pioneering innovators from around the world to English language readers and affordable trade editions. World Poetry Books was, was founded in 2017, and it is affiliated with the Humanities Institute at the University of Connecticut here in stores. Uh, the titles uh, uh, translated by World Poetry Books have been reviewed and excerpted widely, 
and several have received awards, including the Penn Award for Poetry and Translation. Indeed, um, the, poet, the uh, collection which we're going to discuss uh, today, Crops, was translated by Professor uh, Peter Constantine and edited by LCL graduate student Robert Zatrib. And it brings together the stark voices of victims, perpetrators, collaborators, and apologists, all bearing witness in very different ways to pogroms, brutality, and murder in Nazi-occupied Poland, as well as subsequent acts of brutality and genocide in other parts of the world. So with that uh, introduction, it is really an honor and a privilege for me to uh, welcome Grzegorz Kwiatkowski and Peter Konstantin, who will be in conversation with one another today. Peter, I hand the screen over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Avi. And uh, I also want to uh, to welcome Grzegorz Kwiatkowski and, and everyone who's joined us today. Uh, what is particularly heartwarming for me is that uh, it is for, for Grzegorz, as I was saying to him earlier today when we spoke, it's like a homecoming. So Yukon is, is Grzegorz's international home in the sense that, very interestingly, he was, uh, let's say, discovered, and I say discovered from an international perspective here at Yukon, uh, because uh, when we write in our language, whether it is English, whether it is Polish, whether it is Albanian or Bulgarian, anyway, when we write in our language, that is our language, that is our audience. What a translator can do is open up the doors to a, a much wider audience. And uh, the person who initially opened up the door, I hope I hope the person is here, will uh, maybe- He is here. Yeah, so Michal Chibiaz, yeah. So that's that, uh, uh, he first discovered um, uh, it was undergraduate at, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was three years ago, when uh, he first translated uh, Grzegorz, uh, a series of Grzegorz's poems, um, which was a superb surprise. I mean, he found the poetry in a literary magazine, Wutigodnik, um, right, in, in Poland. Um, and uh, that, that started, uh, these were the very first publications of, of Grzegorz in English, in America internationally. And uh, what shows the, the power of the translator, and I say so maybe with the personal pride, is that that also, and we'll see, I think Grzegorz might uh, agree with me on that, triggered other translations into German, into Slovene, into French, into, um, into modern Greek, all of these things happening within the last two or three years. Uh, so it, it, it is a, what one might call a meteoric rise, but from an international perspective, because of course, Grzegorz is a Polish poet, but this is a sort of a new, a new venture, a new opening out. Uh, so what is your perspective of that? Do, do you feel like this is a homecoming, Grzegorz? I just wanted to, to um, see your point of view as well. Yeah, yeah. I always, on, a, on every meeting, I, I'm saying pretty the same thing. I mean, that it's a miracle, miracle of connection, communication and, and, and friendship, but this meeting and this event is really very special because, because Michał Ciebielski, I didn't know Michał Ciebielski, so suddenly my poem, someone asked me for, for permission and the, the poem was published in, uh, in uh, 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 what was the name of the... New Poetry in Translation. New Poetry in Translation and I was totally surprised and and the point is that it was it wasn't only the translation I mean it was a great translation and I, I mean that's the point that I'm very lucky to Michał Ciebielski and to Peter Konstantin because I, I don't want to say anybody thing about any other translators but I'm just lucky to meet on my way uh, great translators who really uh, know the point of this poetry and the point of this poetry is in some way the you know kind of a, the, the landscape the obscenity and the landscape of uh, the obscenity which is a part of the landscape of genocide and central europe and i i think that they got it immediately and and they translated it in a brilliant way so they they opened for me many many great doors and i really think that i started to be understand also in the polish language area because of 
English translations, which is very weird, but but it happened. So do you mean that uh, that the, the translations in America by for our student translators and then myself and others as well? Uh, do you mean that that circled back and and yes in status in so how how would that happen? Like why would English translations affect uh, affect the Polish readership? I think that 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 I, I, maybe now, now I'm not so young, but when I was a younger writer, people were literary critics and, and people from literary society that always told me not to write, not to make a mix of history and poetry, that, that I shouldn't write in poetry about history, that I'm a young author, I should write about modern society, about mobile phones and uh, internet. And, and I was writing about my family, about my roots, about my destroyed city, so I was doing my stuff. But, but uh, I was not not that I was criticized, but I, but I think that most of the the, the 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 Polish readers or critics just thought it's pointless because because the war, Second World War, was the past, and the, these atrocities were were, were the, uh, a long time ago, and uh, and these English translations. Uh, I, I guess that they gave them kind of a signal. I mean, they, they alerted them in the way that, oh, maybe maybe it's really something interesting that we missed. You know what I mean? That, that, that in, in, in this kind of post-Sovietic, homo Sovieticus, post-Sovietic lens uh, as Poland, with my whole respect, but really, you know, it's, it's uh, we, we, very often we, we, we are afraid of our own voices and we, we are, we have to, we believe in, for example, Western authorities. You know what I mean? If something is in New York Times or Los Angeles Times or, or Times Magazine, then maybe it's interesting. On the other hand, when a person like me or my band is, for example, in Los Angeles Times, it, it can all, also be a tricky in the way that people are angry on me because they are very suspicious in the way, how come? What did you do? You know what I mean? That, that we are. Poland is a, in, Pol in Poland, people are still very, you know, you should, you should, you should be humble. Uh, people don't say to each other, you know, hello, Jim Dobre, how are you? It's, we are very devastated. Uh, and, uh, but I don't, I, I think we don't realize about it. But, but anyway, this, this translation was a game changer for me. Uh, uh, so, so now this poetry is, uh, more known in Polish language, but still there is a lot of species around this poetry and why am I am doing that, you know, what is the point? Maybe it's about money or maybe it's about stuff. It's very ridiculous, but it's very normal in the East of Europe. I mean, it's very, very normal that, that people are, are very suspicious to each other. And I don't want to criticize all the Polish people. And you know, it's a very complicated process of devastation, you know, uh, and, and we are really living in very bad uh, geopolitical uh, situation. I mean, between West and East, and it's you know, it's it's yeah, it's very hard. Poland, Poland has had a, a long and problematic history, uh, not only with World War Two. I mean, before as well. Um, over the centuries, it's 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 been um, a very troubled troubled land with with lots of problems. Um, um, actually, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because I didn't say that the, the most important thing. Because may, maybe the, the, the biggest point is that I, 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 in my poetry, I criticize Polish society and po Polish history. I mean that I'm writing about Polish neighbors who killed their Jewish neighbors. I'm writing about uh, genocide. I, I, I'm writing about very, very hardcore stuff, uh, which is not always good uh, from this writing Polish perspective and narration. So I think that, you know, I, I think that many people don't like me for for for, for this kind of, uh, for sharing this kind of stuff all around. Uh, if I understood but, well, I think your first translator, Michal, your first English translator, um, sort of caught that, 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 that interesting ingredient of something that you referred to a little bit earlier, the fact that you're a young poet, but writing about a historical theme that maybe would be best left left unspoken about, or from another point of view, why would 
a young poet, as you said, not write about something something uh, fun and new and modern and, and, and not go back. But what, what was interesting, what we all saw, and I think what, what uh, your publishers throughout Europe, your new publishers in, in Germany, France, and so on, have, have seen is, is that, that very original and unusual and modern and young look back at, at, at uh, the, the themes that you talk about, uh, the Holocaust and uh, the terrible situation with its many layers um, that, that society in, in Poland was exposed to. Um, but actually we, we are speaking of something that so many, many in the audience don't know your work. So what I'd like to do is maybe if we can read one or two of your poems, um, just so that people can see what, what we're talking about. Because I think uh, the one poem that starts the anthology, the collection uh, crops uh, burning, uh, I think is is a very uh, indicative poem, and 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 maybe can it's a sort of a core poem. So if you'd like to maybe read it in Polish, and I'll read it in English, and then we can continue the conversation. All right, thank you. Gdzie jest Izak, Moshe i Wefa? Wszyscy śpią o tu pod tą ziemią. Gdzie jest Rachela, Stepan i Aleksander? Wszyscy oni śpią pod tą ziemią. Stawiski ty kocin radziłów. Czyże w drochiczym jedwabnym. Zarżną nożem osiemnastu Żydów, mówił on to w moim mieszkaniu, kiedy stawiał piec i słońce nadal oświetla dom jego i jego wielopokoleniową rodzinę. Ty Żydówkę wymuciłeś za młynem, a potem podrżnąłeś jej gardło. Cieszy się we wsi ogromnym poważaniem, pomimo kawalerstwa i zaawansowanej starości. A na jego drzwiach do dzisiaj można przeczytać Żydom, cyganom i diabłom wstęp zbroniony. Uderzył dziecko prętem żelaznym tak, że mózg rozprysnął się na jego ubraniu i kazał matce to czyścić. Ciężko pracował w polu do późnych godzin nocnych, był dobry dla swojej umierającej matki, nie sądźmy go w tak trudnej godzinie. Zaczęli być tak, że nie miała białego ciała na sobie tylko czarne. W tych dniach panował duży chaos, codzienne sprawki i przewinienia, mogły wydawać się czymś wyjątkowym. O Panie, o Panie, Tyś wydarł nas z ich rąk. Płonąc, płonąc w stodole, płonąc. Thank you. So burning. Where are Isaac, Moshe, Wefa? They're all asleep here beneath the soil. Where are Rachela, Stefan, Alexander? They're all asleep beneath the soil, in Stavisky, in Tychwotchen, Radziewów, in Chizniew, in Trohitschen, in Jedwabne. He had butchered 18 Jews, he told me this in my apartment as he installed my stove. And the sun still shines upon his house and the generations of his family. You raped a Jewess behind the mill and then you slashed her throat. In the village, he is greatly respected despite being a bachelor, despite being decrepit. And to this day, a sign hangs on his door, Jews, gypsies and devils not welcome. He hit a child with an iron rod, brain splattering upon his clothes and made its mother clean the mess. He worked in the fields, toiling late into the night. He was kind to his dying mother. Let us judge him not in his hour of need. They began beating her, turning her white body black. There was so much chaos in those days, such everyday misdemeanors and transgressions might now seem something special. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, thou pluckest us from their hands, burning, burning in the barn, burning. Um, I'd like to read one very short poem uh, uh, um, that, that, that also shows how many of Greg Jegor's po poems work, which is using the voice of a narrator that no longer is with us. And this is uh, a poem by Buja Vaina, actually the title is Buja Vaina, born 1937, died 1943. I was six when I was killed. My sister Shulamit was four. After we lost our parents, we wandered around Rokitno. 
we learned to sleep in the fields and with time crept into cow sheds and drank milk from the udders of the cows. We didn't have a calendar, so we didn't know when it was our birthday and ended up celebrating more than once a year this sad celebration. So um, I, I hope that these two poems give a feel for, for uh, Gregor's work, you know, as we discuss it further. Um, uh, I, I know that you have a personal connection to, to the Holocaust, as I think very many people in, in Poland do in very many different ways. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Like if what, what star started you writing, if there was something specific that started you writing about this, these historical events? Yes, uh, yeah, I can say about it. I mean, it's, it's very complicated, and it's maybe not such, such a usual Polish story because my grandfather Józef Kwiatkowski was a prisoner of a concentration camp Stuchow, which is located 30 kilometers from the city of Gdańsk, and his sister was also uh, a prisoner of the Stuchow concentration camp. They were Polish, and uh, so he was a young boy. And after the war, he was a broken person. He was more or less in a state of trauma permanently. And his sister was just mentally ill after this uh, uh, camp experience. Mm, and the point is when I was young, when I was, I don't know, eight years old or nine years old, I, my grandfather invited me to, the, to this museum of a Stuttgart concentration camp. He invited me uh, for his first visit after Second World War. And Maybe it was a bad idea. I don't. I don't know. It was the key uh, point in my life. I mean, the, so so he he went there one, once more, and uh, uh, so he started when he was inside the camp at the, the museum. He started to to, to shouting, you know, to crying, to, to screaming, to, to trying to reconstruct the memories. And and I was a child, so I was observing him, and I didn't know what to do. And and and. Uh, it led me to this poetry and it led me to ask myself these kind of questions, you know, why people are killing each other, why people are building concentration camps and gas chambers, uh, etc. So he, he, it had a big impact on me. Uh, and the second thing is that by an accident, because I, I'm, I'm always in some way lucky uh, to unlucky stuff, let's say. I mean, that, so, so I found out that my but my wife is a Jewish person and, and I, I, actually my son is a Jewish person, but it was kind of a family secret. I asked by an exit, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always asking people not right questions. I mean that I'm a king of faux pas situations. So I asked grandmother of, uh, of my wife uh, many years ago on the birthday party, her birthday party, what were you doing during the Second World War? And she said, I was hiding in the forest, you know, it was the Second World War. And I said, okay, but why? I said, everyone was hiding in the forest. And I said, oh, I don't know. Uh, so she was uh, living uh, in the forest near uh, Zeshov. Uh, and I asked her, are you a Jewish person? And she said, I, oh, actually, I hate Jewish people. When I was a, a young girl, I saw two Jewish boys who stole Holy Communion from the church and they took it on the middle and crashed it. So I said, I know the story. It's a medieval ages pogrom story. It's your life. Of course, I didn't, you know, I was very delicate. It was, you know, she was a great old lady. But after all, uh, my wife, uh, found out that, that, that she's got a Jewish roots. But after all, now I can say that they, in my opinion, they all knew, they all knew about it, but it was a really family secret. And the point is that the Poland is still a very anti-Semitic country. And, uh, and I think it's not something which should be the first information for neighbors and everyone. Uh, anyway, any, not, not in my opinion, but, but you know, I've got a son, Franz Lev, he's four years old, and I think he's got the right to, you know, to rediscover his roots. So, yeah, so, so my, my, uh, I'm writing about genocide and I'm writing about the past because uh, for me, the past is all around, you know what I mean? For me, the past is, it's not many years ago, you know, I, 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 I can experience this, this past nonstop and 
you know, the genetic memory thing is a proven thing and, and the transmission of trauma is a proven thing. So, so you know, and so, so for me, you know, and, and Poland is a really a, a country with a, a lot of ghosts in the air. And I, I believe that art is, is in some way like a sponge, you know, that you are taking uh, everything all around to you. And I think you can just listen and you can just have eyes open and heart open and it all goes inside of you. And then you have to do something with that, and then you get a poem. But uh, I also believe that art is something which helps. That, that's maybe one of the biggest points. I mean, that when I was very young, I was a coordinator of Amnesty International, uh, and I was uh, writing the letters uh, to you know to stop some very not ethical murdering things uh, which were happening. So in a way, you know. I was protesting for, from from many many years, but after all, I started to protest by art, by, by poetry in some way. And in my opinion, this poetry is in some way my art of protest. Uh, one one interesting aspect uh, that I wanted to also bring up actually is that we read we read voices uh, of 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 the victims. But uh, you also have voices of the victimizers in your in your poetry collection, and that uh, if victimizers is the right word, but let's say the, the perpetrators. Um, the uh, uh, I remember the very first poem that Michal translated, which shocked me deeply, and I said to him, "This can't be done," because I had misunderstood. Was a poem um, about trains. Uh, uh, like, oh, we knew nothing. The trains, you know, my father knew nothing. He was a good, he was a good um, uh, bureaucrat. Uh, he would send the trains north and south and all that. And it seemed like an apologia, which of course it was. It was the, the person saying, oh no, we, we had nothing to do with it. We didn't know that these trains were transporting people to the gas chambers. Uh, we were just bureaucrats. We were we did as we were told, and so the very first poem that that I read, I thought was a was an a, um, a uh, like oh one of those poems that might be saying that, and then the second and the third poem immediately sort of showed the the cycle, like where where this poem belonged, you know, within within a collection of different voices of of people who were murdered, people who 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 were victims in terrible terrible ways, but also people who who, who ran uh, Auschwitz, people who, you know, the wife or the, the, the cousin or uh, would, would sort of say something that seen objectively is a terrible and frightening statement about how beautiful the flowers in Auschwitz were. It's giving one example, right? Anyway, um, uh, so is there, a, is there a special thought there about, about the, the different perspectives? Like what is the drama, the dramatic connection of that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that the, the point is the American book. The point is that one great American book by Edgar Lee Masters called The Spoon River Anthology. And I was reading Spoon River Anthology, you know, I'm reading this book for many, many years and, and I'm going back to this book and, and most of the poems from this book is, yeah, for me, it's like a, like a matrix. I mean, that, that, that uh, I was, in, in some way, I wanted to to write to picture the the landscape of genocide and, and to, to to paint the landscape. I I, I need many characters and I, I need many voices. I I need you know whole whole town, whole society inside. And and uh, and I think that this, especially these voices of perpetrators, are they work against themselves. You know what I mean? That they they are just they are just hitting, uh, not not in the in the in the side of victims, but in themselves. And I, I also believe in in power of language. I mean that I think that you can always tell if someone is lying or not. It's all in language. Even if someone is saying the truth, the truth, but by the way he's saying that, you can see if if this is the true stuff or not. And and the point is that most of most words. Which I used to this poetry is not something that I imagined. It, this is the real stuff, and uh, what I am doing is kind of a sculpture work. And I, you know, I'm, I'm just making little things around these words, but really little things. 
Uh, and then, then I'm making a montage. I, I'm, I'm making a very strange montage, and I think it's got a lot to do with the music because Edgar Lee Master is, a, is, is one master for me, but the second person is a Canadian, great can, Canadian uh, pianist, Glenn Gould. And I really love Glenn Gould, and I'm listening to Glenn Gould every day for 15 years. And his anti melodramatic way of playing, kind of a mathematical way of playing, is something which for me is like, uh, you know, the, the, the best idea to speak about such horrible things. That if you're speaking about horrible things in such anti-melodramatic, almost neutral tone, then something is happening with the reader. I mean, the, 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 because my poetry is, is in some way like a trap. Of course, firstly, it's a trap for me because I'm writing firstly for me so it's like a trap that for example i'm reading some very obs voice full of obscene uh obscenity and but it's so neutral and and even nice that something is saying inside of me stop you know what i mean you know something is protesting and i think that the one of the points of this poetry is that the real narration is uh uh, that, that the reader is making the real narration, that he, he's going inside to this world, world without good answers, with very tragic questions, and he has to decide. But, but how, how, how could he? You know, it's impossible. So he's suddenly in this, uh, uh, inside this general landscape, and, uh, and I, I heard a lot of voices, uh, opinions about my poetry. From the readers that it works like uh, you know the, 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 the moral moral apparat the moral apparature was turned off and suddenly it's turned on you know what i mean that i'm not a preacher i'm not a teacher I, i'm not i don't know how we should live or maybe i know that all we need is love is the most important thing but i don't know the details but i, I know when someone is making the bad stuff and that's the point you know it, this is a uh, one one thing when we started translating your your poetry at here at Yukon, um, so one question that 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 had come up uh, both with uh, with Michal, your first uh, um, translator, and also the editor, um, a graduate student, uh, Robert Zatrip, was because your language is very distilled and sometimes very complex. And not only that, but it, it it does have these historical moments. It is very Polish in many time, in many uh, uh, many ways, and then it also transcends that in many ways. So, from a translation perspective, because there are quite a few translators, uh, as as we have very strong translation presence at UConn. Uh, well, the thought was, you as a poet, if we were to ask your advice, because we always know what we want to do and we discuss it amongst ourselves, but as we have a, 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 a live poet before us now, would you suggest that when we are translating your po poetry that we do what we call foreignizing, meaning that, that the, the poem will sound strange and foreign and Polish, even though it's in English, or, or would you prefer to see your works uh, domesticated, as we say, where they are very um, much, let's say, Ameri they become new American poems. What is your perspective there? And, and how did you do, by the way? Because you, as you can read English and you've read all our different translations, uh, how would you grade us on that, on that level? I, I, I'm a fan, I, I'm a fan of, of translation, which are so into the new language. I mean, for example, the English language that the readers should believe that it's, it was written in English. I mean, uh, and, and I've got, a, you know, for example, as you know, Jonathan Franzen or George Saunders or Alice Oswald are fans of this poetry translated by you. And they all wrote that they, they read it as a things uh, written in English. They, 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 they don't feel any sense of translation. Uh, and it, for me, this is ideal situation. I, I mean that, that I, 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 me, as, me as a reader, when I, when I watch the movie or I read the poetry or, or, or a prose, I would like to believe in this world. I mean that I, I would like to believe in the fiction, you know what I mean? I, I, uh, 
and like a, like like, like a situation when you are a child and you are hearing the fairy tale and you believe in that. So, so for me, it should be smooth, delicate, neutral, and open. And I, I don't need any, uh, you know, uh, technical advance. Uh, situation with a language uh, which are hard for a reader i think it should be very very open for the reader and i think you you know you, you're the best translator i i met and and, and I, I think your versions are are i guess even better than polish in some way because the one thing is you know because i think that you got the point uh, this this obscenity is, is is all around in your translation and uh, uh but 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 it's also full of melody and uh, and in some way aesthetic, it's very aesthetical. So, uh, well, you know, it, it was in a group project in many ways, and and that's something that that I, I suppose we need to acknowledge. Uh, um, I mean, Robert Zatrip, who who yeah, really explained every aspect, then the American editors, you know, such as Henry Gifford or Jake Searsack, uh, who uh, who also help it's always good uh, dis despite a translator well uh, Michal from one perspective uh, who's a, a very young translator or someone like myself who's been translating for 40 years it's always good to get a second and a third and a fourth opinion so it's, it is a group project um, which is very much new way of working I think uh, I don't think we used to translate that way when I when I was younger back in the 1980s but uh, it's a brave new way and, and it seems to be working. Um, I also want to say one thing that we noticed. Yeah, before... one, one, one thing that I'm very thankful to the whole team. I, you know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, uh, so um, what we noticed and what I think Alice Oswald also very much uh, uh, has, has, has said from what I've seen in, in her writing about you uh, is that you, you have a distilled way of writing, like every word counts and it's very, very compact. Now, I, I know how you work because I'd asked you about that, but it is a, a rather unusual thing. You set yourself limits in, in a sense, uh, objective limits. Uh, first of all, what are they? And do you advise us to work that way as well? Yeah, uh, I, I will not give any advice, but, but I'm working in a very, I'm, uh, hard and easy way I mean, because I'm writing everything on my very old Nokia which is not connected to any you know it, it doesn't work uh, I can't call to anyone uh, by this very old thing but but I'm writing a poetry on it and, and uh, there is a limitation of a, a, what one SMS can be it's, it's one poem and it's very the point is that, that I, I've got many ideas and many pictures inside my head or, or I hear many voices and I just have to make this lapidarity process to 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 put it on this phone and it's very hard to to click the buttons because uh, yeah because it's just old and, and and it's like a trash and the point is that that so if I will if I would have great machinery all around this I would like you know write and write and Right, and suddenly I, I have a big limitation because uh, this little thing is so hard that maybe I'm even lazy. So I have to make you know one sentence from ten sentences when I'm driving on, the, on, on uh, a bus. So riding a bus. So so I'm just doing it, for example, to remember what I should do with the poem when I'll be home, and then I'm opening this uh, old mobile phone. And I see that the poem is ready. I mean, that, that I just did it because this mobile did it uh, because of this uh, lapidarity situation. So I think I've got a lot of things that work on my side and everyone has got this kind of things, you know, for example, that, that you can focus on something and, and find uh, objects or things or people that, that can support your uh, process of creation you know for, for me for example I'm the person who's got who's wearing the same things for 15 years I guess I mean the same shirt the same I mean that I've got free free not free but I guess uh 15 or 20 pairs of this kind of shirt and, and, and my shoes etc but I'm doing 
in some way, more or less, the same thing for 15 years every day. And uh, I've got the same haircut and, uh, and I don't like changes really, but after all, they are very good, but I, I really don't like it. But I, the point is that because of this lack of changes all around me and the same methodology where I, which I work, I, I can really, I, I think so, maybe I'm wrong, but I can really go deep inside something, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, I, 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 I can in some way isolate from the, from the many things that, that can disturb me. And yeah, so, 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 so I, that's why I'm very focused on, on music and musicality and, and history and obscenity and morality. But I guess I'm really focused on, on it in, in a big way. I mean, that, 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 you know, I, I'm obsessed. With, with it. I mean, when I'm hearing some, some anti-Semitic voice somewhere, you know, I just he, he, hear it and I know which part I should write down, you know, and that, that I know what to do with it and, and then I know what I will do with it, I know w w what will be the place of it, so, you know, maybe I'm like a robot, but I don't know, I, I don't know. Well, let me ask you, uh, um... Before we open up the, the, the questions, I want to ask one last thing. Um, so many of our students are inspired by the by the, the paradigm, the example of Michal having found you, and within two or three years, because I think it was three years ago, wasn't it, or maybe four, that he maybe first found you. So within four years, so many books have come out in so many languages, it triggered this this whole new opening up, just because one of our undergraduate students, uh, well, not just because, but well, in a sense, maybe because it did trigger all that. It, it, it led directly to the next and the next and the next. So it's inspiring. Do you have any advice from the poet's perspective or from the author's perspective for, for us young translators? Because we have, we have, with us, I don't mean myself, collectively. Uh, do, do, do you, do, what would you suggest, let's say, for, for somebody who's who's looking for for young Japanese writers, young Macedonian, Bulgarian, young like what what do you what do you suggest? Do should we reach out? Uh, how did we reach? How did Michal reach out to you? Did we do it? I can't quite remember. But but what do you have any advice basically on that? Like from what does a poet say to a young translator who wants to to discover somebody new? Mm, I, I think that that we should. Just listen to ourselves, paradoxically. I mean, that, that, that we, we should know what we need and what fits to our psychology and our, our history of, of our life and our family. So, if there's a the good territory we are living in. Yeah, 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 I think that we should really know the landscape, I mean, the, 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 our inner landscape. And then, you, you are re, you, in some way, you're searching for similarities. I mean, the, 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 uh, it can be a different culture and different language, of course, but I think you, you, you're searching for something which is really exciting for you. That's, I think that's the point. That, that when I'm making something or, or, or reading something, for example, when I'm reading Thomas Mann and I'm rereading Magic Mountain and I'm reading Magic Mountain every year for many years, I'm always excited. You know what I mean? I'm just, you know, I really believe in that. I really believe in the story of Hans Castor when I'm reading the parts of Kwab Diashusha and they, you know, I, I, you know, I'm just, you know, in love. And, 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 and I think that maybe that's the point that, that this state of, maybe not an exaltation, but state of love. I mean, that in the process of, of translating or even if I write a poetry about such tragic topics, you know, uh, Anyway, I, I, I'm obsessed with, with the um, with the language, with, the, with, with these characters. You know, I, I believe in, in both good and bad characters. You know, I I, I, I I read some very bad voice. For example, this Walter Stier about this father who was, ma was making executions, and I'm terrified. For example, when you were reading this burning poem, and I was listening to it, I was I was just angry, you know what I mean? I was angry and I couldn't listen to that. I mean, that, that for me, it was too much. And, but so maybe the point is that, that, yeah, you should just give yourself to the thing you are doing and to the research, to, you know, to everything you're doing. And I think you should not, 
for, and I'm really speaking as a Polish author from city of Gdańsk, the capital. I'm in the north of Gdańsk, in Poland, in, in Gdańsk, where the Second World War started, but also the Solidarity Movement, the Worker Movement started. So, uh, but the, the point is that in, in some way, more or less, I'm isolated. Rather, rather more, more in, in more way, I'm isolated. Also, Trupa Trupa, play, play my band, is playing more in the Western world than in Poland. And I think that when you're isolated and in some way you're not accepted, because I think we are not accepted as a musician and, and me as a poet, more or less. And I think this is a great thing, you know, that, that you, you can, you know, that you can uh, in some way take yourself from, 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 you know, with your whole expectations, exaltation and, and yourself uh, and give it to the others, you know, in the way you want to do it, you know what I mean? And I think it works. Yeah. And opens those doors and and yeah, gives gives a, a new. Uh, I mean, you say you're not accepted, uh, which is surprising to, to hear because uh, you're very much accepted in the English language world and in in Greece and in in France, uh, Germany. So, so it, it it that is interesting how there is a, a second life to your work. Um, yeah. That that a second life when when it is translated into a different into a different language, yeah. But uh, I'd like to. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, uh, so if if we could uh, open it up for questions from the audience, that would be uh, that would be delightful. Actually, a lot of audience. I, I'm really surprised. Thank you, thank you, Peter and Gregos. I I. Uh... I want to open up to questions, and um, so I, we can, uh, folks can type their questions into the chat. I also see that um, Chris has has raised a hand. I have a question as well, but I'll, I'll uh, Chris, I'll, I'll allow you to unmute, um, and I'll add you to the screen here so you can uh, ask your question. Go ahead. How's that? How's that? Am I unmuted? Yes. Good. Can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for this, both of you. Um, Jago, I'm the other professor in the translation program at UConn. Um, I had a question just to get us started. Now, what is it like for you as an author to be translated? Especially, what is the difference for you as far as trusting your translator when you do know the language, such as English, or when you don't? And secondly, because of the nature of your writing, I know that for some artists uh, who work on such topics, for example, the French film director Alain René comes to mind when he made Night and Fog, um, which the French called Nuit et Brouillard. The, um, he insisted that the the words and the writing be those of Jean Cayrol, who was um, a colleague of his who had spent time at the camp in Goussen in 1943. So he, for some decision of his, there was an authenticity question where only Kehol could speak these words because he had been through a similar ordeal. Now, when you're handing these words of yours over to another translator, first of all, in English, do you second guess the translation because you do know the language? And when you don't know the language, how does it feel to, to experience that? Uh, thank you for these questions. And, and, and uh, I think that yeah, I know a bit of English, so so I I I I know that yeah that for me some translations are better and some worse and uh, and so but but I think it's that's not the point. I mean that for me, it's like uh, you know you can feel by emails or or Zoom contact or phone contact with a translator. You can feel energy. I think I've got a good intuition in some way to to the people, and I think that. You can just feel the energy between you and and, and the translator, and you that, by that, uh, you know, uh, is it working or not? I think that this spiritual aura between you and translator is most important, and I think that, in some way, I think that the good thing about me is that in some way I'm a kind of a you know like a pazzo. There is a word in Italian, pazzo, I, or like a little person like a Duke Mishkin from the the idiot. Do you know the? You know, I'm very open in every way. So I think open also in the way that someone can say that I'm stupid or naive or you know, anything. And I don't care. You know what I mean? 
the, the, the point is that, that I think that, that my contacts with successful contacts, these successful, because there were also others, but these successful contacts with, with translators were also based more or less on friendship and on some, you know, not playing, but, but you know, we didn't wear masks. We were all, always very open to, to ourselves. And I think that it's a bit the same as I, the same story I told you 10 minutes ago or five minutes ago about the state of love, exaltation, state of be open on the other person, you know. So state of trust and love, something like that. I, I think that if you trust someone, you know he will not hurt you in some way. And, and then I think it will, it, it work. Uh, so I'm not suspicious. I'm, I, I, I'm not searching for, uh, for mistakes. I, I just can feel if something will work or not. And that's all. But maybe I'm wrong, you know. It, no, this is my point of view. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Peter, we have a, we have a question in the chat, which I will uh, address next. This comes from, um, from Justin Taverna. Um, so Justin asks uh, to Grzegorz, how do you feel that your work with Trupa Trupa connects to your poetry? Do you feel like they play off of each other equally or does one influence the other more strongly? Uh, yeah, Trupa Trupa is, uh, is, 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 is a Trupa Trupa question is a good question, generally about art and making art and about making it in an ethical way because we, we have the democracy in a band, we don't have a leader in a band, we don't have a front band. Got... So the point is that usually rock and roll bands has got one leader, one front man, one vision, and Trupa Trupa, everyone has got a different taste, you know, we're listening to different music, we've got different ideas, and while I'm a part of this band, so I've got my, I'm focused on history, on, on, on pretty similar stuff uh, uh, that I'm writing in poetry, uh, and sometimes for example, critics are writing about Trupa some will back at Lonely Hearts Club Band, in the way that it's, it's like a mix of the Beatles and, and some will back at thing. Uh, but I'm not so happy with that because maybe that's why it can be read as my band, you know, that, that this is a band of a poet Krzysztof Kwiatkowski and that's why. So, so, so there is a poetry, Trupa Trupa, but there are two people who are writing lyrics, me and my friend Wojtek, and, and the point is that anyway, we are, we are doing everything together, and, uh, and uh, it's super hardcore thing, so it's not a natural thing. Democracy is not the state of the nature, totally. I mean, it, uh, it's very hard to work together. It's very hard to work with the people who've got different ideas and different tastes. And I think it's a very great lesson of democracy. And, the, and maybe the, the most important thing is that, in my opinion, the best songs we produced and we made was the songs made by an accident. And there are a lot of accidents when people don't understand each other. You know what I mean? That, that, that some very not obvious things are, 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 are uh, we, we can create very, very not obvious musical states because Sometimes we don't understand exactly what you what you mean or what you mean, and, and that, then suddenly the song is born, and, and we are listening to this song, and we just say, "Wow, my God, it's, it's great!" But we couldn't. I wouldn't do it by myself, and my friend wouldn't do it by himself. But we did it as a in this chaotic process. So poetry is an important thing, but it's not only about poetry, and it's not only only about me. And in some way, this is a, a good being in. in this kind of event is a good lessons of humanity in the way that you have to learn how to uh, keep your ego, you know, uh, not so big, you know what I mean? You have to be very careful and have, you have to have eyes open on your partners and, you know, because I, I've got this kind of a tendency to, you know, to speak, to have big monologues and to be excited. But, you know, the life is different and I have to listen to people. And the, and the best things actually are happening when, I, when I'm listening to people and then I'm mixing the ideas. I don't know if I have an answer, I don't know. Yeah, no, very, very good. And Justin says, thank you. All right, thank you, Justin. Um, Peter, if I may, I'm gonna ask a, a question that um, connects to sort of this process of translation, but also what you brought up in terms of uh, Grzegorz's uh, uh, 
your process of writing. Um, and because it seems, and I'm very curious about both from the translator's perspective, but how you both manage this issue of audience. Um, because it seems that, you know, in your poetry, there's something very personal, there's something very emotional that um, you're channeling through your poetry as you write it, that I'm curious as to how much you're thinking about uh, your audience of readers who might read it in Polish and might understand the references that can be very specific to historical places or to a site like Yedwabne, um, which might be more well-known in a sort of a, by a non-Polish audience, but still there are kind of historical facts that may not translate so well, um, for example, in like a burning barn, let's say, where uh, a large group of Jews might be massacred in a town. And I'm curious if you're thinking about what your audience will understand as you're writing your poems, or you're just sort of channeling your own emotions through your poetry as you write it. And then Peter, for you as the translator, or for the group of translators, to what extent do you feel an obligation to make sure that some of these sort of historical references or specific place sites or inside knowledge that might be known by one linguistic audience but may not be known by an outside audience, to what extent do you feel an obligation to explain that in some way through the translation? So I, I asked a question for both of you, but uh, maybe I'll let you start, uh, Uh Well, I, I as, as I said at the very beginning, I mean, the that uh, maybe it sounds egoistical, but I mean that, that, that I write mostly for myself. I mean that, that uh, in some way I'm experiencing life through writing or and reading, maybe rather reading. And, and it's very strange, but I I think so. So so because I really believe in power of words. I think, but but really, you know when someone is saying apple. When, when, when I see the word apple, I see apple, apple you know, I can, I, can, I can smell apple. But I, the, the word is for me so exciting. And the word means, um, yeah, the word means the world. That, that's, that's, that's my point. But, 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 but more, I, more I write, more, more I've got this kind of uh, international lectures, I, I, I've got a feeling that there are a lot of very important things to say. and. That my poetry is just that, let's say, we, we can begin with the poetry and then we can move on. I mean, to the, to, for example, to the Yedvabne. Uh, and great that you said about it because, on one hand, it was commemorated, but on the other hand, it wasn't because till now uh, you, you will not read who, who did that, who murdered uh, Jewish uh, neighbors, uh, and of course, Polish neighbors did that, but it's not written there. And I was there very uh, several times. It's not written there. So, on the, or, or you know, in the city of Gdańsk where I live, there is a there was a Jewish ghetto, and it's called you know forgotten Jewish ghetto because it wasn't commemorated. No one wants to commemorate it. Mm, and I'm fighting. I'm appealing. You know, or, or I found with my friend almost half of million shoes of prisoners of uh, from uh, shoes from uh, most of concentration comes in Europe and we were fighting for seven years for, uh, you know, with the officials from this museum to, to secure these artifacts of genocide. And in some way we failed, you know what I mean? But, but, but I'm appealing and I think that, that my obligation is to, to go deeper, uh, to the deeper to the facts, to the history and to the situation all around, for example, the bloody war in, in Ukraine, you know. The, the, so I think that the, the poet, this poetry is just a, in some way starter to, to, to make this moral, moral research in the past, but also all around, you know. And, and this more I live, I, I mentioned to you that when I was young, very young, I was a coordinator of Amnesty International, and then I, uh, started to be on, only an artist. But after all, I think that it's all combined. I, that, 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 that I think that in some way, this poetry and these lectures works like a human, right work, human rights work. You know what I mean? That, that it's all about human and it's all about, yeah, this, this naive but very true motto, all we need is love, but also all we need is a memory and all we need is a truth. <laughs> so there are a lot of things we, we need, uh, yeah. Yeah, and what I'd like to add to that is that, well, um, when I was growing up as a, as a younger translator, um, the great 
Russian-American author Vladimir Nabokov, who you might have read Lolita, his, one of his most famous novels. He was also very much in, interested in translation. Now, he would have been very upset at what I did because uh, his, his famous statement is, I want footnotes that are skyscraper high. So in other words, you would want one of your poems, let's say a short poem, four lines, very, very small at the top, and then maybe the rest of the page footnotes, or maybe even two or three um, uh, pages of footnotes, meaning that everything about Yid Wagner, that, that it needs to be known, should be in a footnote. Everything uh, about uh, Rajivov, everything, why, what's behind this? Why are you connecting it? Why is it these four towns? What happened? What happened with the Red Army in 1920 when they, when they with the pogroms um, and on and on. So that I didn't do. There's not one single footnote there. There is an introduction that I think sets the tone. What, I, what I'm happy to say though, is, is that it seems that these collections were very effective. I mean, they were effective when when Michal first published you and and there were no footnotes because people understand. They might not specifically understand uh, Yedwabne, maybe, like what what happened there. But on the other hand, it's clear that that something absolutely terrible is going on within this poem. And interestingly, one thing that that the, the great uh, young young translation scholar. Karen Emmerich has said, people now can read with iPhones. So look it up, you know, um, which of course was not the case in the 1970s and 80s when I was starting with translation, because then it was on the page and there were no, if you had the dictionary behind you, you were fine. If you didn't have it, then you didn't know. You could maybe call someone on the rotary phone to ask them, what's this about, you know? So anyway, uh, in that sense, Maybe a bit of a chaotic answer, but I but I guess I feel that 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 people approach the poems as they are and maybe absorb what is there to the extent that they can, and they seem it seems to be working. Yeah, I hope. No, I think it's an it's so interesting because there's a real tension there. I mean, the historian in me wants footnotes, but then it completely ruins the poem and. Uh, you know, sort of the way in which it's initially intended and the way in which it should be read and the spare nature of it, right? So, what, one option leave, for back yeah. notes, of course, uh, would you have welcomed an addition, let's say, with, with uh, 10, 20, 30 pages of back notes for people who want to? Because that's one thing that publishers might do, uh, particularly somebody like W.W. W. Norton, really do not like footnotes but are prepared to give back, back notes for people who want to have, know more. My problem is, is that you then read a poem like Burning and you come to something and then you go to the back and then you come, so there's this, this back and forth maybe, but you might also be able to read it and then study it and then come back. So would your, would your advice be that, that we should do footnotes or back notes? I mean, I'm asking Avi now, uh, where we, <laughs> we've, we've, we've moved. Because I know that, uh, I know Gregorsh, uh, I have a feeling, Jagosh. I mean, you and I never actually discussed it, but I think you did not want any footnotes, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're also talking about here. But let's, uh, I mean, from a historical perspective, as a one-liner, back notes, yes or not for something like this, or is it is it an open question? Well, I think your point about flipping back and forth is very well taken, right? And um, And one thing that you know, we can do now is, as you said, anyone can look it up or you could have a site where if you want to learn more, go to this site and then you have the information um, available. Um, I, I see a couple more questions. I, um, we have a few more minutes, yeah, Peter, for, for questions. Um, yeah, we have another, I would say five or six minutes. If, if... Okay, um, so, uh, Mariana writes in, this is um, from Mariana Bachvarova, uh, writes in, what is something that you hope people will take away from your writing? Mm, I, I think that, mm, that evil is not something from the past and, 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 and that, that most of us can or just have this kind of a thing inside of us. I think that, 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 that we are more or less, you know, uh, people who, in, in some very 
the awful circumstances could 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 make very bad acts, moral acts. I mean, that, that I think that we should just watch out. I mean, that we should just you know watch all around and be very delicate and very uh, you know. In some way, that maybe the point is. Um, I'm, I'm thinking what what to say. Um, you know, yes, the, 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 the history is not a history, you know, and, and I think that the, the, this, this, war, this, 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 this Russia aggression in Ukraine just, just showed about it. But, but anyway, there are a lot of wars, uh, non-stop, but this, this one is, is really, you know, horrible. But everyone, every, everyone is horrible. And from Amnesty International Times, I know that, you know, atrocities and very bad things are happening almost non-stop, unfortunately. So the point is that I think that the point of these poetry is maybe this uh, motto, I mean, all we need is love, not violence, you know, all we need is love, not gas chambers, you know, all we need is love, not concentration camps, you know, and, but, but we have to, we have to realize, I mean, realize the, the murdering potentials of, of us, uh, maybe, maybe that's the point, something like that, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know, as you, as you, as you, as you hear, I don't know, I'm just, for example, I'm afraid of violence. I'm, I'm afraid of evil. You know, I, I'm, it's not it's not territory which is fascinating for me. You know, not at all. You know, I'm afraid of it. You know, I uh, I'm afraid of people who are lying. I'm afraid of people who are full of hatred. You know, and in the, in some way, this poetry is the effect of that. That, that. that I am afraid, but I would like to analyze it, analyze it, and to, you know, uh, and to and to make something with that. And, and in my opinion. I don't want to say I'm successful in Ukraine, but, but I'm trying. You know what I mean? That I'm trying to say that the the world of morality, you know, is not gone. You know, the world of history is not gone. It's it's it's, it's happening all the time. You know, uh, in every uh, in life of everyone. I mean, your your uh, you know every day you can for you know almost most of us are lying more or less even if we don't realize about it. So maybe you should just every day say to yourself, you know, I will try not to lie in such a big way, or I will try to be nicer to my teacher. I don't know, you know what I mean? But everything is is a thing about morality and about uh, uh, different people. And I think we should really learn to respect and to love different people. I know this is the hardest thing, but I think this is the point of this poetry. Yeah, we, we have time for one more question. I see that, uh, that Michal, uh, your your first trans translator uh, ha is asking a question. If if I can read it out, um, so of the people who do support you in Poland, could you describe them? And what's so people who do support you in Poland? Could you describe them? What sets them apart? Do you have any observations? Uh, actually, Michal, you mean you mean support. Uh, or do you also mean like, like do, do you mean both support and not because there are two factions, right? Um, hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you after all this time. Yeah, so if, yes. maybe ask your question directly. Yeah. So my question is, there's people who don't support you in Poland, you mentioned, but out of the people who do support you and who resonate with what you're writing, um, do you have any particular observations about them? Um, do you kind of have a feeling for what sets them apart in some ways? Yeah, you know, I I I don't have a problem with uh, you know with people who don't support me or I don't think that people should support me. I, I think that people who support me in Poland are real, you know, in some way heroes for me and, and real miracles. But 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 I think that as I said at the very beginning, it's, people are always very suspicious when someone is making something. Not in Poland, I mean in the Western world. On the other hand, when you're doing your own stuff in the Poland, they just don't care because you know we should uh, be writing uh, as a part of some school. You know what I mean, art school, or you know that, that you are author who is writing the same way as you know different young authors or stuff like that. But I'm a person who is you know just writing my own thing and. It's rather more connected in some way to, to the past. On the other hand, it's it's got a lot a lot to do with you know the cinema of Harmony Korean or something like that. And on, and on the other hand, something it's, it's got a lot to do with Don Giovanni by Mozart. So it's a really strange mix. And I think that many people don't 
know what to do with that. And if we will combine it with, uh, with my band, with Trupa Trupa, then a lot of people who are readers of poetry and critics think that maybe I'm kind of an entertainer. You know what I mean? That, you know, I'm playing on a guitar and I'm playing at festivals and I'm you know, shouting on the scene. So maybe it's something which is more connected to publicity and the world of show business. You know, I think they are wrong, but, but, but maybe. I don't, the, the question, the, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't say that I don't care. You know, I mean, it's a good question, you know, but, but I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, well, this has been a really fascinating, fascinating discussion, fascinating program. Um, thank you both uh, for an excellent discussion. I'd like to invite our our audience um, as much as we can. We can uh, sort of have a virtual round of applause. So, thank you, thank thank you to both of you. Um, and uh, I want to uh, thank our, our program in, in uh, translation studies and world poetry books and uh, Professor Peter Constantine and of course, uh, Grzegorz Kwiatkowski for really a fascinating discussion. And I think an important message of um, the importance of, of this work that you do both driven by a desire to uh, generate really empathy and understanding and um, love and memory. So thank you so much for your work. For those of you who have been here today, the program has been recorded and we will post it on our um, Yukon Center for Judaic Studies uh, YouTube channel. And we would love it if you share with anyone um, who would find this to be of interest. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, uh, Go ahead. I, I would also you know, say how, how happy I am and, 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 and I'm so thankful to you, Avi, to you, Peter, to you, Michal. And uh, yeah, for, for me it was like a, like a journey to, to my translate to my tra translate translation home. I mean, it, 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 it all began on the, at your university, and, and, and now we're talking about it a few years later. And, and Peter is working now on, on, on new poetry, so it's a, it's like a cycle. Uh, yeah, so thank you for being with me. I saw a lot of great friends in the audience. And the audience was brilliant. So thank you for great, great questions. Of course, I'm sorry for my broken English, but in some way I used to use it for many years. And I think it, this this broken language, broken uh, English is just my English. And that's all. I will not change it, even if I would like. It. So thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Jinkuya.